Good evening, everyone. Hello. How are you? It's great to have you here tonight. Has it started snowing already? OK. Well, then I'm, I'm especially grateful that you all made it in here tonight. We definitely have some seats in front. So if you're in the back and you'd like to come closer, um, please do. It's actually really nice to fill the space and to be together in conversation, especially for this conversation. So I'll just give you a minute if you want to get up and come forward. And please do. Thank you. Come on up. All right. My name is Smitha Narula, and I am interim director of the Human Rights Program at the Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute. On behalf of Roosevelt House and of the Women and Gender Studies Department at Hunter College, it's my immense pleasure to welcome you all and our panelists tonight for this very timely conversation. Harold Holzer, director of Roosevelt House, sends his regrets that he could not be here to welcome you all. And I'd also like to add that we're very grateful to Harold for all his support for tonight's program. The Human Rights Program at Roosevelt House is an interdisciplinary program that offers a minor and a certificate in human rights. We have the honor of being housed in Roosevelt House, which is the former home of Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, and to continue their human rights legacy. For any students who are interested in our program or in the public policy program, come talk to us at the reception tonight or, or just come find us uh, one day on the fourth floor in this building. Our program this evening is very much in keeping with the threefold mission of Roosevelt House to educate students in public policy and human rights, to support faculty research, and to foster creative and thoughtful dialogue on issues that are at the forefront of public discourse and debate. And there can be no doubt that the issue of sexual harassment and sexual violence is very much at the forefront today of public discourse and debate. But only certain voices, it seems, are able to push their way to the front of the conversation. Indeed, many perspectives continue to be marginalized or omitted from the conversation altogether, including those of cis, trans, and gender nonconforming women and girls of color, of migrants, and of low-income workers who must contend with multiple forms of structural, racist, and economic violence that makes it especially difficult for them to speak out. The Me Too campaign, as many of you know, was founded by activist Tarana Burke, who more than 20 years ago met a girl in Alabama who confided in her about being sexually assaulted by her mother's boyfriend. Burke desperately wanted to tell the girl that she too is a survivor of sexual violence, but did not know how. In 1996, Burke created a nonprofit to help victims of sexual harassment and assault and coined the phrase, Me Too. In Burke's own words, it wasn't built to be a viral campaign or a hashtag that is here today and forgotten tomorrow. It was a catchphrase to be used from survivor to survivor to let folks know that they were not alone and that a movement for radical healing was happening and possible. This panel tonight seeks to engage the Me Too conversation by exploring the power dynamics that are at the root of sexual harassment and assault. Our panelists tonight will discuss many things, um, including what it takes to achieve accountability and lasting reform in the face of entrenched socioeconomic inequalities. And our panelists will also situate the Me Too campaign in the context of the global struggle for gender rights, highlighting the need for transnational solidarities. Before introducing our panelists, I'd like to offer a special thanks to the Women and Gender Studies Department for working in partnership with us to bring this program to fruition. The Women and Gender Studies Department has also put together a wonderful reader with some resources, um, as well as many links, which will allow you to continue this conversation beyond the event. And uh, we will also make sure to send this all electronically to all of those who RSVP'd for the program so that if you want to access it elect electronically or weren't able to grab one, that you will have it. We're we're also grateful for the generous support of the Stepanski Family Trust, which helped make tonight's program possible. And our thanks to the many members of Roosevelt House, um, of the staff of Roosevelt House for their support in conceptualizing and making possible our event tonight. I'm also pleased to welcome the many members of our faculty and of the Hunter community who are in the room tonight. I thank you for all your presence and for your work. And last but certainly not least, I welcome our students. We are especially pleased to see so many students in the room tonight. This conversation is first and foremost for you. 
And now to our panelists. I could easily spend the rest of the night um, detailing all our panelists' many accomplishments and contributions to the field, along with my own deep admiration for their work. Instead, I'll be brief and maybe share some things that are not in the program that you have with their detailed bios. Joanne Smith, say hi, Joanne. <laughs> is the founder and executive director of Girls for Gender Equity and a tireless advocate to end gender-based violence and promote gender and racial equality. Joanne is also an alumna of Hunter College Graduate School of Social Work. In her work, yay! <laughs> it's okay. Um, in her work, Joanne calls on all of us to continue onward with a radical and intersectional queer anti-racist lens and to stand fearlessly in our full truths and our full humanity. It's an incredible treat to be on the receiving end of Joanne's fierce grace and wisdom. If you ever need a shot in the arm, you can look up one of Joanne's talks on YouTube, which I do often, and uh, it will leave you inspired, I promise, and ready to take action. Please join me in welcoming Joanne. Nisha Varia, say hi, Nisha, hi. Is, uh, is the Advocacy Director of Human Rights Watch's Women's Rights Division. Nisha is also a longtime colleague and friend. Nisha has been working at the intersection of women's rights, of gender-based violence, and social and economic rights for as long as I can remember, and long before many people at Human Rights Watch and other international NGOs were doing so. Nisha has single-handedly documented the stories of hundreds of women who have experienced everyday humiliations and horrific abuses in countries all over the globe, including and especially domestic workers who have been locked up, unpaid, and beaten in their workplaces for years. Nisha has also helped grassroots women's rights organizations the world over grow in their impact and their reach, and has helped put in place key protections to safeguard women's rights. Please join me in welcoming Nisha. Mm -hmm. Vanessa Velasquez, at the end, is a senior at Hunter College, graduating this spring with a double major in English and theater and a minor in human rights. Vanessa is also, yeah, we can give a clap for that. <laughs> um, Vanessa is also currently a research intern for the Hunter College New York City Food Policy Center, developing a survey on the conditions of restaurant workers in New York City. Vanessa and I got to know each other a few months ago when she came to my office and sat down, and we just had this incredibly healing and nourishing conversation where she shared with me the incredible journey that she has been on and that leads her to this moment today and also led to her decision to extend her time at Hunter just so that she could complete a human rights minor. There was something in all the work that she was doing and all the wisdom that she was receiving along the way that made her just truly feel and under believe that she needed to advance and invest in herself as a social justice advocate. And it's a real honor and pleasure to have you on our stage today. Thank you, Vanessa. Please join me in welcoming her. Mm -hmm. And last, but certainly not least, please welcome uh, Linda Martin Alcoff, who will be moderating tonight's conversation. Linda is professor of philosophy at Hunter College and the CUNY Graduate Center. Linda is also a prolific author and celebrated author. Her latest book entitled Rape and Resistance will be coming out in May with Polity Press. Earlier this year and together with other eminent scholars and activists, Linda co-authored an opinion piece in The Guardian entitled We Need a Feminism for the 99%. That's why women will strike this year. In the piece, Linda and others wrote, me Too, Us Too, and Time's Up have not just exposed individual rapists and misogynists, they have ripped apart the veil that hides the institutions and structures that enable them. On March 8th, International Women's Day, we will strike for labor rights, equal rights for all immigrants, equal pay, and a living wage, because sexual violence in the workplace is allowed to fester when we lack these means of collective defense. March 8, 2018 will be a day of feminism for the 99%, a day of mobilization of black and brown women, cis and bi, lesbian and trans women workers, of the poor and the low-waged, of unpaid caregivers, of sex workers and migrants. On March 8, we strike. Please join me in welcoming Linda. Mm -hmm. 
I hope you're thoroughly convinced that the conversation is in incredible hands. And without further ado, I hand it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Sunita. Welcome, everybody. I think this is going to be a great conversation to assess where we're at and where we need to go. Um, I want to thank my colleagues from Women's and Gender Studies, Rupal Oza, who's working on this topic, Catherine Razaguer, and Jen Gabori for doing the legwork to really put this together tonight. So I think the j just to orient our conversation, um, I wanted to say that I think the, it's clear that the public visibility of rape and sexual violence today is a complex phenomenon. There's still a lot of lurid sensationalism in the coverage and a very selective focus on certain sorts of victims. But there's also this form of, you know, this kind of new moment of public declarations of victimization and resistance. And each new case that you hear about reverberates, it kind of echoes across the globe. And there's also, I think, we can think about the echoes across different institutions, from the Catholic Church to the US military to Hollywood and other sorts of institutions. So what I think we're witnessing today is not just the emergence of a hidden discourse that's now coming into the light of day. I think what we're really witnessing is a contestation over the terms in which sexual violations can be public, can come into the larger public domain. It's a contestation over who can speak, what they can say, who will be accorded credibility, how the circulation of their speech occurs, and what the subsequent effects of that speech will be. So we're seeing victims speaking out and gaining, in some cases, a public platform. But this speech is packaged, interpreted. It's given a spin. It's highly circumscribed. Um, and you know, it's entering into a, a mainstream, um, corporate-owned media universe, which curates the coverage for its own purposes. So however much power accusers may seem to be having today, we need to remember that survivors are rarely, if ever, in control of the way our speech is edited, processed, packaged, publicized, globally transmitted, interpreted, understood, or taken up as a cause for action, or the kinds of actions that ensue. We are speaking. But the institutional context and the domains of public communication that our speech is entering into, they don't always share our priorities. These domains mainly want to protect their brands, their market share of consumers, and the existing institutions of our society. And like any smart aristocracy, right at this moment, they're trying to calculate how much change is necessary to keep the peasants at work. So we're seeing mostly celebrity stories because that's what sells. Sexual violence is a dramatic story that garners attention. And so it has value as a political football. Today, it's being used in competitions between electoral parties, media empires, and corporations. And it's long been used to legitimate war and a racist carceral system. I don't think this should deter us from speaking out. But we need to strategize. Our voices are too often used for agendas that have nothing whatsoever to do with finding the real causes of the problem or the real solutions. So the strategic question for this moment and for tonight <laughs> is how to enlarge the movement to include workers and immigrants, the most vulnerable groups of victims. And further, how to help broaden Pub, how, how to help broader publics see through media spin. And finally, how to outsmart those who would make use of our courage for their own agendas. So let me turn to our speakers tonight. I want to start off with a question to each of them, starting with Joanne. Um, how did you get involved in this work? That's huge. Um, thank you for not an asking me to answer to that call to action in this first question. Yeah. Not yet, right? Um, so I got involved with the work. So often I say uh, we come to the work because we are the work. And in starting Girls for Gender Equity, I'll start there. I started with a fellowship. And I often start there because 
for me and my family, it has shifted the trajectory of our lives, right? Uh, 15 years now leading an organization um, as the executive director, uh, where I, I'd never thought of that even as an option. At the time, uh, with starting Girls for Gender Equity as a fellowship, it was an 18-month program. And it was an 18-month program through the Open Society Foundation, this is how I framed it, right, um, that I could do while starting here at Hunter School of Social Work, Master's Social Work Program. So it meant I didn't have to work, right? I could do this fellowship program and I could strategize um, to, to bring programming to the community. And I could work with young people. That wasn't work to me. Um, and I could go to school full time. And quickly uh, realized, oh wow, um, the, this work, right, this, this work um, to gen end gender inequity um, shows up in so many ways. And it showed up really um, in the way that was my gut check. It was when three months into the program, 80 participants, 12 volunteers, um, I'm, I'm almost replaced um, within the program and an eight-year-old girl was raped on her way to school at 8 a.m. in the morning. And this is in the neighborhood that we're in. The little girl went to the school that our girls go to who come to the program, and at eight in the morning was brought on top of the police, police athletic league roof, brutally raped, left there, and a man with red eyes, red contact lenses, fled the scene. Now this baby got off the roof, walked to school and passed out in her principal's arms. And this was the gut check, right? This baby could be hyper visible to this man, to this rapist who could see her and do these horrendous things to her, but completely invisible to this entire community as she is walking to school at eight o'clock in the morning. And this black baby, right, reflects me reflects the young girls that I'm here thinking I'm here to save and to have some fun with, uh, and, and really reflects the culture in which we still live in today, right? And so for me, that was my call to action. It was the, the moment I realized this can't be a fellowship. Like I need to get basically out the way if this is just a fellowship, if this is just something I'm doing you know, to, to, to pay bills or, or for fun. Um, this is lifelong work, right? Because the young people that came into the program that day are the ones who shared the story with me. And in sharing the story with me, found ways to disconnect and say, you know, this classmate of theirs always oh, fast, right? You know, um, if she wasn't wearing those tight jeans, you know, act like a woman, be treated like a woman. I mean, these are things that they heard than the adults at that time saying about this incident and ways in which they could separate themselves from, you know, becoming potentially a victim of sexual violence and how they understood, you know, they could also hold on to their power in the situation. And, you know, this was then their narrative. And so needless to say, I, I blew my top, right? I didn't, I didn't do everything right. Social work school was necessary because I was just starting. Um, so I, I, had, I had a lot of practice. But what I did do was commit to this as lifelong work and commit to working with young people um, to really interrupt gender-based violence and prevent gender-based violence uh, before it was a crisis. Um, to do so with young people, um, not only as stories, but also as experts and advocates who can tell you what the solutions could have been. That baby girl, she, at eight years old at that time, said to her principal, you know, I was gonna go into the store, but I didn't wanna be embarrassed. You know, I, I didn't know if they would believe me. And so I just tried to hurry up. And so she had a gut instinct and she knew, what would it look like if we created conditions for young people to follow their gut, right? And created conditions where going into that store meant that she would be believed and she would be protected and not further violated or not in fear of being embarrassed, right? She knew something was wrong that this man was following her. And so even creating with young people policies and practices because um, understanding that you know the the work in um, shifting the way in which uh, policies within institutions um, uh, protect you know our young people or, or or set up to protect our young people often fail the most marginalized young people. Our young people in school often get you know suspended the zero tolerance policy suspended when they uh, fight back against sexual harassment. They're considered 
you know, fighting or, you know, hitting and it's seen as a fight. So they get, you know, suspended or detention or even worse, expelled, suspended for being gender nonconforming, for being trans, and often sexually assaulted or sexually harassed by the staff that are set up in the institutions uh, to protect them, whether that's, you know, the actual teachers or principals or whether that's the safety agents that are set up to protect them, um, but really that they don't, don't want in the schools. Um, and so the work that, that's how I came to the work and the work that um, we do and the ways in which young people have taught me, you know, how to do this work, um, you know, has me consistently learning um, and, and consistently coming back to this work. Um, to really figure out how it is we shift the conditions that you have listed out for us to solve today on this panel. <laughs> Nisha? I have the same question. Um, I think that, um, as with so many people, it's, it's a mix of um, personal experiences and what we um, observe in our environments, and um, and also I think my education uh, opened up a lot of uh, perspectives to me. Um, I remember being uh, a young girl growing up in North Carolina, and uh, one day when we were all going to school, something very similar where um, you know they were actually stopping all of the cars and um, sort of checking to look for a missing girl, and it turned out to be a girl who was in my uh, younger sister's class um, who had been abducted and um, sexually assaulted and killed. And I lived in a community that was very white and black in North Carolina, um, but she was one of the only other Asian girls in, in the community. So it really just struck us. And I think, you know, from a very young age, um, seeing the vulnerabilities that, um, that we experience and, and all those intersecting um, identities of uh, being a girl, being in a migrant family, um, uh, being an other in, in many ways. And, um, and I think that, you know, sort of situating sexual harassment and sexual violence in a broader um, framework of just gender discrimination going back and forth between my families in the U.S. and India, I would really just see, you know, the different um, frameworks and constraints um, and freedoms, you know, that uh, that I would experience or that my female relatives would experience because of, of their gender. Uh, so, you know, this is something that just really opened my eyes to this issue. Um, and I think what has been really motivating for me, um, often entering this work through a, a labor organizing lens is the power of coming together, the power of unity, what happens when um, we try to break down the isolation that really permits and allows such violence and harassment to take place, but that when we come together, there is collective power, there is a way to create dialogue around issues that are often invisible, there's a way to fight for seats at tables of power that are much more difficult to do alone. Um, and so in my work at Human Rights Watch and community organizing in New York City, I have found that, um, you know, labor organizing and other types of community organizing has been an effective tool. And, um, and I guess I would just say, you know, part of the, your question is how did I come to this work, but I think part of what keeps me in this work um, is those relationships as well, because you know, it can often be so depressing, it can be so daunting, you take some steps forward and then you have some steps back, but it's really when you have community and networks um, that can sustain you. I, I feel like I've met such incredible people and, um, you know, that's where you get the vision for how to keep on fighting for a better future. Thank you. I'm glad you raised the issue of labor unions because I think that that's what's come out in this moment is that it so it often affects women's employment. Mm -hmm. This is a job issue and it needs to be a standard part of union contracts. There needs to be protections and procedures built into every union contract from here on forward. So Vanessa, the same question. Thank you, Linda. Um, I would say that um, I started off uh, as a as a rebel in my own family, very young, I 
disagreed firmly with a lot of the norms that society placed on um, people that were incarcerated, people that uh, lived outside of the regular norms, like the margins. And I didn't know what marginalized meant. And when I figured out what marginalized meant, I totally identified with those people. Um, and so very young, I understood a sense of otherness. And that um, led to me feeling personally connected to stories of people that also felt that otherness. And so the greatest interests of mine in school was English and theater because those were the places where I felt that people were able to tell their stories in a safe way. And I personally never felt uh, able to have a voice and speak out about my own personal traumas or experiences that really stuck with me uh, very young and growing up into you know adolescence and then into early adulthood. And so literature and, um, and, and reading books, I mean, I was like, books were my life and mainly books that had to do with uh, people who had had experience, women who had had experiences of all different kinds, bullying and um, harassment and feeling othered and all these things. And so I thought, well, this is where I can dive in. This is my connection to the world, is you know, storytelling. And so I came to New York to do theater. Meanwhile, I had been in the restaurant industry since I was 15. That was how I wanted to enter my way into my own personal banking system. I said, I'm gonna get into the restaurant industry and be a server and make money and then go to New York and study theater. And um, so the restaurant industry became a place for me to have my own independence. And being in it for so long, after so many years, it was a way for me to get through school and it really uh, supported, I supported myself that way. Um, and what I found was that uh, the restaurant industry was a microcosm of the rest of the world, and um, I started to place my life in school and everything that I was learning in the context of power systems, and so I began connecting the dots with, you know, reading about people who were marginalized and being, um, you know, on the receiving end of different kinds of oppression and marginalization, and then being in an industry where I saw it with my own two eyes or experienced it myself all the time and how normal it was. And so slowly but surely, um, I, I really zoomed in on how my personal connection to those kinds of stories of real people and fiction and all of those combined through art and advocacy um, was a way to enter the sphere of taking action. Um, so I. I guess I, I could say that I transitioned from being uh, a reader and an observer to more active and slowly but surely also gaining my own voice and what I think now is getting a little bit louder and I feel a little bit more um, hopeful and encouraged by a lot of really supportive people that have that have helped me get to this point in my life and I hope to be able to do the same and I hope to be able to continue with my work in this way. And, um, you know, that industry that I have a personal, you know, relationship with is just one of many industries where I have known uh, young women to use as, as a way to support themselves financially. And then it turns into this big, scary monster um, that they can't get out of because it's how they support themselves. And so, um, as Smitha mentioned earlier, I was about to graduate in the fall and um, for a long time I'd just been feeling like the whole reason that I want to create uh, art and I want to tell people's stories is um, because I think that was my way of connecting to the world and so I thought, well, how can I really do that if I don't understand um, some of the fundamentals? And I took a human rights course, the Intro to Human Rights course, actually almost three years ago, and I became completely uh, engrossed and totally enamored with the idea of doing advocacy, but I had no idea how to enter into that sphere. Being an English and a theater major, I just felt even there, I was like, I'm totally outside of this. But um, before I graduated, I thought to myself, well, there's so many ways that um, I, I might be able to potentially create a, a platform or even just a space for 
women uh, to tell their stories. And so even if there's just one woman's story that I can tell one day, then I will be happy. Thank you. I'm sure there's a lot of people in the room that can relate to the problems of restaurant work <laughs> in which sexual harassment is kind of like a daily occurrence, right, on the job. But we didn't call it that. We just It's just like just the nature of the work. So let me, let me um, ask you all to put your analytic hat on for the second question I want to ask you. Um, and then we'll open it up and have, have an opportunity for your questions and comments. But I'd like you to, to answer the question about you know, how you assess where we are at this moment in this movement, this Me Too movement, um, this decentralized global movement, really. Um, and how, how you assess um, the pros and cons, the pluses and minuses, what's good about it, and, and what we still need to, to work on. So you want to? Does anybody want to go first? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's, a, that's another big question. Uh, when I think of this moment, I think of it as a moment um, where our movement to end gender-based violence has gone mainstream. Um, for me, for my peers, for folks who have worked to end gender-based violence, including sexual violence, sexual harassment, the whole arc, right, of, of gender-based violence, um, with interpersonal violence, institutional violence, um, it has been so hard, right, to get, um, not just uptake, uptake, funding, um, priority, policy, practices. I mean, um, you know, it's been so, when you think about, you know, the, the, the let's say, domestic violence movement, and 20 years ago, 30 years ago, domestic violence shelters uh, starting as a, um, you know, reaction to domestic violence and, and gender-based violence in that way. Um, you know, it, since then, I mean, we have worked to really, um, try to make gender-based violence intersectional and understand that you know, gender-based violence is connected to gun violence. Domestic violence is connected to gun violence. Um, the violence that happens within the prison industrial complex, right, within prisons, um, by the institutions, right, by the guards. Um, when, when girls are in juvenile detention and they are pregnant, if they are locked in juvenile detention with other girls and they didn't come in pregnant, how did they get pregnant, right? Like, basic, you know, trying to um, shift, you know, that judicial system and, and judges and the way in which courts work, the way in which um, uh, sentences are handed down, the way in which child sexual abuse is even talked about as part of the arc of gender-based violence, right? Um, understanding oftentimes it starts, our, our public discourse starts with uh, sexual assault in college campuses, right? But I... I, you, we all know a whole history of, you know, sexual violence that happens, you know, from the time young people are born, right? Whether it be in our families, whether it be young people we know, whether it be our friends, and, and even if it's not child sexual abuse happening, uh, sexual harassment happening, right? As soon as you hit puberty, um, especially, you know, in the streets, when, when you are confronted with, you know, older men or older folks who don't really see you as a child, right? Again, being hyper-visible at that stage. And so for, for, for me doing this work over the last 15 years, it's, it's been like hitting my head against the wall. Um, it's, it's felt like to have this kind of public conversation, the mainstream conversation around something even as simple and pervasive as sexual harassment, right? Um, one, of, one of the folks who used to work with me, Nefertiti Martin, used to call that the gateway drug, similar to the gateway drug in gender-based violence, because that's the place, sexual harassment is the place where um, um, folks test you, right? How far can they move that boundary? Uh, how much can they get away with? Uh, it's an entry point. And, and, and many times, you know, it may not sound like it from, you know, the vantage point of maybe having more power as an adult, but for a 12-year-old kid, for an 11-year-old, for, you know, someone who's in a situation where they rely on, you know, that adult, that is an entry point. Somebody who obviously is working in the restaurant industry, um, who's working in the in the army, whose um, you know livelihood is dependent, but also um, you know basic rights are dependent. You know human rights are dependent. Um, 
that that is a gateway. And so I think this moment offers us you know, a real opportunity for this public discourse to happen. It offers us an opportunity to uplift the work that has happened and the solutions that many survivors have already um, um, offered and, and, and lent, whether it be through legislation or it be through simple practices, right? It offers also, and this is, you know, something straight from Tirana, survivor to survivor healing, right? For Tirana, me too, um, which, which started in 2006, I'll just say, I'll just plug that. Um, Me Too was about uh, survivors seeing survivors and affirming right their humanity and affirming that it happened to them too and, and they're still here, right? So it's also an opportunity for joy and, and reclaiming that, look, I still survived, I'm here, right? Um, and when I saw Me Too as a hashtag, um, you know, first time I saw it, I mean, so easily, so many of us were able to post, yes, me too, it happened to me too, uh, because we finally felt like we were part of uh, a community um, who has really risen above, right, um, not being what gender-based violence has done to, to you, but going through what gender-based violence has done to you or sexual violence has done to you. So I want to name that while it's an opportunity to strategize, it's an opportunity for us to um, really shift um, the paradigm in which we talk about you know, um, gender and racial equity, in which we talk about these institutions um, that so many of us are a part of. It also is a space and time right now um, to really celebrate and follow the leadership of survivors who for years have been um, leading and telling their own stories, right? And have been showing up in so many ways um, together and for us to shift the conditions so that it doesn't happen to somebody else. So I, I see a lot of opportunity and I can go on about specific opportunities. I mean, even here in New York City, our young people testified uh, for the CCRB board, a c civil, Complaint Review Board um, that uh, passed a bill so that they are the Civil Complaint Review Board where our public folks will go and bring um, sexual violence complaints as a, that uh, against the police as opposed to bringing it back to the police for the police to review and decide did sexual violence really happen? The Civil Complaint Review Board will be that board. Um, and so it's a, so many possibilities around policies and practices that have shifted uh, because of this moment. Um, so I see it as that opportunity, opportunity for joy. And I also see it as uh, a, a space and time where you know, we, we have to keep the momentum going. Um, one of the things that I have, you know, realize that many of us probably realize is, you know, with, with these shootings, I mean, just today, my family's in Maryland, right? And just today, the school shooting in Maryland happened. Again, that has been happening, right? Um, but our, our country and our attention can't hold so many things at once, right? You can't fight gun control uh, policies and practices and hold, you know, Me Too at the same time for too long. So. I think us as advocates, um, and especially within the you know, school public policy, really have to push for, for Me Too to, to remain center and, and this kind of discourse to remain central in our conversations and, and policies um, on the everyday and, and really examine uh, how we do that by, by taking a look at uh, the day to day and the institutions in which we work. Fantastic. Nisha? Sure. I mean, it's a big question. How do we assess where we are now? Um, you know, first of all, I just want to say that I've just been impressed by how much visibility it's given to an issue that has been invisible for so long. So, you know, I think always when we think about where we are, it's, you know, appreciating um, when there are advances, right? Um, and also that there's many conversations happening that are quite nuanced and that there's space for people to come up and challenge, you know, when there isn't the, um, you know, the perspective that they'd like to see reflected. Um, and that we've seen, you know, beginnings of, of some accountability. We've seen powerful people who have finally seen some consequences. So, you know, 
first, I always feel like it's important to say, like, okay, here are some concrete things that are happening that we were not seeing a year ago and that, that we're seeing now. Um, but then, you know, always taking this perspective, I've, I've been in this movement for more than 20 years, um, you know, what, what do we need to see? And, you know, the, the first thing that comes to mind is sustainability, um, you know, and especially with things that sort of um, have taken hold in social media. I feel like it's so easy for things to have a big splash and then also then uh, diminish pretty quickly. And so, you know, really thinking about how do we institutionalize and really keep a momentum and, and be sustainable about this increased awareness about these uh, keeping on to increased spaces, um, you know, where are we going to be in one year? Where are we going to be in five years? Where are we going to be in 20 years? Um, so I feel like that's a, a big question to be asked. Um, the second thing is, you know, how inclusive is this moment, right? And, um, you know, big questions about um, how we're understanding gender identity, how much that's a part of the, the conversation. Um, you know, from a lot of the work that we're doing at Human Rights Watch, um, we've done a lot of work on abuses uh, of sexual harassment and sexual violence against women in, in female-dominated sectors, particularly the garment sector um, and domestic work. And, um, you know, this is often framed as a global movement, and I think it has international dimensions where it's gotten attention, but I don't think it's really a global movement yet. Um, when we look at the garment uh, factory workers in Bangladesh and Cambodia, where we have just documented you know, rampant sexual harassment and abuse that are part of their daily lives, um, that are part of an overall system where there is real repression against you know, labor organizing, where women are threatened with rape if they join a labor union, where um, you know, the entire you know, factory management will be male, and which is very connected to <coughs> us in the United States and other places because these are women who are manufacturing for the brands that, that we wear. You know, Human Rights Watch, we've documented this in factories run by Gap and H&M and, um, and, and, and many others, right? Um, those voices have not been a part of the recent conversation. Um, we've also documented a lot in terms of migrant domestic workers. There's a really robust domestic workers movement in the United States, and it's been really gratifying to see, you know, how they've been uh, a part of the conversation here. But that's not um, really happening at a, a global level. And, you know, domestic work is one of the greatest sources of employment for women around the world. So inclusivity, and that's, you know, I can talk more about that in the q and I don't want to um, go into too much detail now. Um, but just to say, you know, assessing where we are, it's thinking about change and change that's really institutional, change that's personal, um, thinking about who's talking, who's listening. Um, and just in terms of that global perspective, one thing that I can flag is that the International Labor Organization, it's one of the, the UN agencies, they have actually been talking about um, violence and harassment in the workplace for years. And as a culmination of those efforts, there's going to be a negotiation this June where governments around the world, workers associations around the world, and representative of business associations around the world are going to negotiate a new international standard on you know, sexual harassment. Um, and this is just such an incredible opportunity because we know there's huge gaps in the laws. There's more than 60 countries that have no laws against sexual harassment at all. And those that do have them, they're often really you know, minimal. Um, they're, they're not very comprehensive. They're not well implemented. And you know, these negotiations are going to provide a chance to provide some real guidance to governments, to employers, on um, what standards should be for sexual harassment. And I think the Me Too movement has really exposed how many questions there are about what the response should look like, where are legal obligations, what about you know, due process and proportionality, right? There's been all of these like, different questions. And to have some real guidance um, about that, and, and in particular, that when laws are on the books, they tend to focus, when we're talking about sexual harassment in the workplace, they tend to focus on the most serious abuses with criminal penalties. And this is really an opportunity to provide more guidance on the whole range mm -hmm. of sexual harassment that happens and, and thinking about a different range of civil remedies as well. Thank you. Um, I agree with a lot of what has already been said. And one of the uh, 
one of the things I agree with most is that is this idea that it's become a mainstream movement. I think that's as far as if we're talking about pluses and minuses, that is a huge plus, and that in a way, um, I dare say that it has become advocacy or or interest in the movement and what's going on and and awareness is is almost a, a pseudo brand now. It's something that uh, people are becoming interested in and saying. Well, uh, how how do I fit into this conversation? And 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 you know, and it's and it's rampant, and it's great. And information has has you know become more accessible to a lot of people, especially in the way that um, especially women and, and young girls, or even even you know, women in generations that have come before us, have come to this realization that something happened to them and they didn't even know that that was what was going on. And now they know what's going on, and they know what happened, and I think that that's a huge plus. Um, there are a few other pluses that have already been mentioned, so I won't repeat them. Um, some of the minuses that I think are um, important are, um, you know, there was a great article um, you know, in Time Magazine about the silence breakers, and Melissa Harris Perry said, but the space has not been silent. Our nation has been deaf. And I just, that rang so loudly for me because you know, these kinds of abuses have been going on for a really long time. And you know, when asked about why um, the whimpers of white women were always heard louder than black women's screams, um, in Yes Magazine, Tarana Burke answered, because we are conditioned to respond to the vulnerability of white women. And unfortunately, it's a conditioning that we have become accustomed to. And so now I think this movement, the, one of the pluses of this movement is saying, what about everybody else? And I think that that's a, a plus in a way, but a minus to that even is then people who are good or people who are good guys, or when men who are good guys, or you know, women who are um, advocates for all women are, are are maybe feeling a sense of being attacked or something. And so, you know, like Matt Damon was like, well, what about not every guy is a bad guy? And, you know, it was like, focus on how you're perpetuating this culture and less on how you are a good guy, you know? Um, so that was, that was something that I was like, that's, you're, it, it's like hurting, it's hurting the movement. So that's a minus in my book. Another minus is um, uh, industry standards and like transparency of policies, like sexual harassment policies, what to do if something occurs in the workplace, who to, who to tell, how to, how to report it, and what, even on a management side, what to do. Uh, that's actually something that the NYC Food Policy Center is structuring the survey that we're drafting right now that um, uh, is like going through IRB right now for, for exemption for application is within the context of conditions of restaurant workers, one of the aspects that needs to be addressed is, you know, from a management and a worker perspective as far as like front of the house and back of the house, does everybody know what to do if this happens? You know, and I don't think it's that clear. I really don't think that that's something that's happened yet. Most of the women that I know that have experienced this kind of behavior have cre have been a part of what has been become to be known as whisper networks. We know who to stay away from. We know who we can trust. And and in a way, it's been a good thing. And in a way, it's been a hurtful thing. And you know, not knowing who to turn to and say this happened and this is who's responsible. And then the women that have been able to tell their, share their stories with somebody in the workplace, um, you know, either have not been believed or have been humiliated by the person who, you know, made them feel this way or who harassed them or who assaulted them. And, you know, Ken Friedman and Mario Batali were not the first people in the restaurant industry to act this way or to, you know, be accused of something like this. And, you know, it's, it's a long, it's it's a it's a huge net and it reaches far and wide and so visibility about how far that net extends needs to happen and and we need to create systems that support women who have experienced this kind of behavior as far as the net goes that oppresses them um, and so if that means that there needs to be more transparent policies about what to do if this situation occurs 
then maybe that's something. But I, I really don't have the answer as far as like how to fix the problem. I just think about how, you know, in my own ways, I've, I've come to reflect on all the different industries I worked in and, and how I never knew what to do and I never knew who to tell. And, I, and, and if, in, uh, from a management perspective, if I was a manager, I wouldn't know how to handle that. And most often than not, the managers that I did know that knew about this kind of behavior would, um, for lack of a better term, sweep it under the rug and we would, you know, we would have to accept what was going on. It was part of the culture. It's a, it, the restaurant industry is a culture of abusive behavior. It, it happens behind closed doors. It happens in small rooms when the door is closed and nobody knows what happened in that room. And, and it's aggressive and scary. And, you know, it's just, it's one of those situations where you don't even know what's going on, you know until you step out of the room and then you maybe tell someone or you tell no one and years later you come to realize what happened in that room. And so I think um, part of the plus is that women are starting to say, well, ha yes, hashtag me too, and then what else can I do besides hashtag me too? This is so great. I'm really learning a lot, actually, from this discussion. So we're going to open it up in a minute. But let me just ask one last quick question, maybe just for, to give you two sentences or so to answer. And I think I know how you're going to answer this. But the, the, you know, the issue of whisper networks that you, you raise um, has generated uh, some discussion about whether or not the movement has gone too far. Right, this is sort of a meme right now, and there's some feminists who are who are arguing this as well as the mainstream. When the whisper networks become publicized, for example, is when due process um, gets ignored, um, they argue. And so, I I I I think I could bet money that this trio does not think the movement's gone too far. <laughs> But how do you respond to that kind of issue, or why do you think that that's the issue that, that is reverberating in the, in the mainstream right now? Um, my answer to that is um, never far enough, ever. Um, I think that, that the movement is, um, is a slowly gaining traction moving train, um, and that at some point or another, um, you know, it's it's like, it's almost like the people who are asking if it's gone too far are the people that aren't sure whether to jump on board or to support the movement or or feel somehow stung by it. And I'm not sure where they fall into the conversation, but I do feel that. Um, there is a lot of conversation around, you know, credibility, and I think that that's a problem. You know, if we start questioning every woman that accuses somebody of this kind of behavior, we're never going to get anywhere. And and you know, a lot of these marginalized voices are women that lack resources, um, class status, or even you know the acceptable skin color to have their stories told. And I just find that, you know, the more that this movement tries to get halted, in, in, for some people, the more traction it will gain. And for others, perhaps it will be a way that it gets slowed down. But regardless, I think that it's, it's never far enough because um, if the pendulum swings way too far left or way too far right, it's better than if it doesn't swing far enough at all. Um, I mean, I think that, um, you know, the concern about has this gone too far enough means perhaps that the message of how deep and how endemic institutional failures mm -hmm. to acknowledge these problems are, um, you know, for years in every industry, on the street, in homes, we know that there has just been a systemic failure to acknowledge these abuses, to act on them, to prevent them from happening again. And we had this moment where people are turning 
to public spaces, to public shaming, because there's an avenue that has been opened up when so many other avenues have been closed. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's just a message that, you know, uh, should be taken really seriously and that a few months of, um, you know, public exposure and, and you know, really increased conversation um, doesn't mean that those institutional gaps have now all of a sudden been resolved. And so uh, that, that's, my, that's my response to, to that. And, um, and just to say that I, I think, you know, it's, it's interesting sometimes to see all of a sudden this concern for, for due process um, when, you know, really there isn't, again, from this labor rights perspective, most workers do not have due process rights in general. And so, you know, it's part of the, a broader conversation of what we would like to see. I do think coming up with good systems that protects everyone's rights in the process are the sustainable way forward. Um, and, and so that should be kept in mind, you know, uh, um, that we want transparency for, for anybody involved in a complaint. Um, you want, um, you know, <coughs> proportional responses, um, but we really need to acknowledge the systemic and historic marginalization of the people making these complaints right now. How the hell are you gonna ask, has it gone too far when we have a president <laughs> that sexually assaults people, right? Who has publicly said on record he's committed sexual assault. Like, like really? Like how? How, how can it go? It, it, it hasn't gone far enough, right? Like rape culture has gone too far, right? Cis heteropatriarchy has gone too far, right? Being in positions of poverty and in intergenerational poverty has gone too far, right? We have to go further. We have to mobilize. We have to also see ways in which, right, even without violations of sexual assault, we have to shift power. We have to shift leadership, right? We have to prepare. You know, I'm always going to rep the young people, prepare the young people to take our seats, right? Properly prepare, not tokenize prepare. Right, that's cute, you know, knowing you're setting them up for failure, right? But properly prepare. So this is an intergenerational movement. This is lifelong work, y'all. Like, Me Too hashtag went viral October 16, 2017. I know, because my office was a wreck, right? Like, think about that. It is March, right, 20th? Is that six months? Maybe seven? It hasn't gone far enough. Is that five? <laughs> God. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's open it up now. Um, we want to hear your questions. Uh, we have a few guidelines. Please wait for the microphone. Please state your name and affiliation, if any. Um, and try to ask a short question for e either a particular speaker or you could ask it for um, the panel in general so that we can get as many voices in the room as possible. So who'd like to start? Um, my name is Matthew. I'm a, I just finished Hunter. Uh, I was wondering what do you think sh would be like the ultimate um, end result of like if Me Too, if no one hashtagged anymore, no one shared it, but um, it was, it still had the most um, lasting impact, what would you want to see that impact have to be uh, like, in, like as the end result? I mean, thinking broadly, right, it's an end to uh, discrimination and violence. If I was just to say it really short, you know, I'm uh, the mother of a two-year-old girl. I'm expecting another girl in June. And I want them not to experience what I've experienced. I want other mothers and fathers and, and parents and um, to know that, um, you know, we're going to have a, a world where that's actually possible. I want to say congratulations. I was wondering, but I didn't want to ask. <laughs> congratulations. 
and and ditto. I mean, I mean, we would we would, you know, end gender-based violence. I mean. And yes, congratulations as well. And to speak on, uh, to jump off of that, I think, um, you know, I, I think about my place in the world. Like I'm in New York, and um, and I I have certain privileges. And just coming to the school, I always feel like, my God, I'm so lucky, you know. Um, and so, in my mind, an end goal would be that. Uh, women everywhere feel like they can go somewhere to talk to about these issues and that something's going to get done and that they don't feel like I'm going to say something and it's going to fall on deaf ears and I'm going to report it to a police officer and it's going to go into a file and it's going to be in that file until it's burned someday. And to go further than that, um, communities really start to get involved with each other, you know, and really stand up for each other, and that um, both men and women feel like this is, this is a movement for everyone, and then for it to reach far and wide outside of the people who can, can even create a hashtag, you know, on a global scale. There are women who are victims and survivors of physical, emotional, mental, and sexual abuse all over the world in refugee camps, people who are internally displaced, um, you know, glo global, global scale, you know? So, yeah, I, I think it's something that's like starting in a lot of communities that are able to have these conversations and then hopefully, um, you know, ideally, to live in a world where gender-based violence is simply unacceptable on any scale and that people will be held accountable. And I'll, I'll just add one more thing. Congratulations to you too for finishing Hunter. Um, uh, but one thing I just wanna hit home is um, really when I think of like what would be, the, what, what would be a victory in this would be um, that, child sexual, that child sexual abuse is actually a part of this conversation, a part of what we're interrupting also. Because when you think about gender-based violence on a spectrum, when you think about what allows folks to be vulnerable to sexual assault in high school, sexual assault in college, as an adult, oftentimes, or even what the perpetrator, right? What allows a perpetrator to be sexually violent, oftentimes it starts with child sexual abuse. And I don't think as a society, like we, we have those conversations, we don't see it as part of the arc of ending gender-based or sexual-based violence, um, and that, that we need to. Like it needs to be as, uh, that conversation needs to be as normalized as possible because when not dealt with, this is then the culture that we breed. And so that would be success for me. I just want to add, I mean, I think we, we want better responses, but we also want to change things that happen before you need a response. And that means changing sexuality for everybody, you know? And, and I think we can think big like that, because rather than thinking that this is just a natural human thing and there's a certain percentage of people who will be perpetrators and that's just the nat human nature, I, I think there's a lot of evidence against that kind of fatalistic view, the eroticization of dominance and violence we see promoted in so many ways all around us. And there's institutions that not only promote it, but you know, make it possible. They, they create the, the uh, they, they provide the victims. They, they create the conditions for it to happen. So I think we can we can think, um, beyond just good responses to also, as the, the panelists are bringing out, think about um, changing the conditions of how we become sexual beings mm -hmm. and how we enact our sexuality as, as human beings in a way that, you know, is lots of fun, but, <laughs> but, uh, but not this kind of eroticization of dominance and subordination. So another question. Maybe we can alternate gender, get, get, a, get a female <laughs> over here.
Hi, I'm Jamie. I'm a senior at Hunter. I'm a gender and women's studies major. I'm actually in Professor Oza's um, senior seminar class. And um, you mentioned like going the quote unquote like going too far. And I feel like that turning point really happened um, when the Aziz Ansari accusations came out. Um, I feel like that really turned the movement from institutional and structural problems to questions of like cultural and interpersonal violence. So um, you mentioned like changing sexuality. Like how do we change sexuality? How, what do you think, um, what do you think is, is, is like the likelihood of success greater if we focus on like more institutional problems that we can see more clearly? Or like how does that translate into broader cultural interpersonal relationships and like changing how people relate to each other sexually and what's considered acceptable? Well, let me turn to the experts over here, but I will say, if you think about the Hollywood issue, and you think about people like Harvey Weinstein, these are the people that are choosing which scripts to produce, right? Which, which movies are gonna get $10,000 to make and which are gonna get $200 million to make? Those are the people who are making the decisions of our visual culture that influences millions and millions of us starting when we're babies. Right? This is what we see, this is what we hear, this is what we know. So there's things that can happen. <laughs> Aziz, I'm sorry, anybody yeah. have a view of Aziz? I'm, I'm so glad that you asked this question because I think it was, it was one of the stories that, you're right, really rang true for, um, well, a lot of people, a lot of my male friends asked the same question, like, did this go too far? Um, and I think, again, something I said earlier is like, if you're asking that question, then maybe the answer, maybe you're answering your own question. Like, the fact that it's made you question whether it's too far or not is actually really important. Um, the, the debate around whether what he did um, was seen as like, sexual violence or coercion or if the, he had consent or not you know it, it was it was so much focused around him and it became about him and how he was being victimized and all of a sudden it shifted from what happened to this woman and how she felt and how it took her a year to even think about this as problematic um, and one of the greatest things about the story that I personally was I, I had an incredible amount of respect for her for saying out loud was how normalized it seemed, how how that kind of thing, you know, I know so many male friends of mine that were like, well, I, I don't know, I, maybe I acted that way with somebody, I have no idea. And, you know, it's, it's one of those complicated factors, but I think with this specific story, if we're, ter if we're you know, talking about it in terms of like institutional versus like personal level, I think you know, this is one of those personal stories that shows how like, it's not too far because that made a lot of people question what too far was. Um, just to say, yeah, I mean, uh, agreed with, I, I think it, uh, it generated a lot of conversations which, which needed to, to happen. Um, just some thoughts, I mean, we talk at Human Rights Watch a lot about comprehensive sexuality education, and I think that, um, you know, what's happening in schools, the conversations that we have in our families, the conversation we have among our peers and our communities, um, we really just need to have much better conversations and education about sexuality and you know that's um, you know much more beyond like how do babies get made right it's about relationships it's about respect um, it's about you know understanding consent and and power dynamics and um, and so I, I think you know we are so so far from having anything close to that and I think it's really important in terms of just having spaces to think about it, to discuss it, to debate it. Um, and then the other thing I think is, is you know, modeling that behavior as, as well. And, and I think there's lots of ways um, that, uh, that, you know, modeling that behavior, you know, creating positive models is, is really important. 
only, the only thing I'll add is, um, so then you keep right comprehensive sex education in schools, right? Um, which you know was a struggle for New York City public schools. Um, now it's back, right? But how comprehensive is it? Is it trans inclusive? Um, does it talk about uh, young people who are non-binary? Um, you know, does it give room for the the discourse? I know as an uh, organization that does also after school programming, we can't even bring condoms into the school, right? Um, so, so I mean, and then even starting this panel, right? We we didn't even start with gender pronouns and probably should have, right? Mine or she and her, and and so we build into our our fabric, I think, um, ways to make room uh, for those who are invisible often, um, and not just when it's comfortable. Um, can I just say one quick thing also because I think yes, sex education in school is such a is such an important potential factor to to help this. But like in the home, I mean, I I didn't grow up in a home that it was discussed ever. And I think that it needs to be in the home it needs to it needs to be discussed. Children need to understand, I think, things from their parents. They're their direct, you know teachers in the home and I um, I feel very strongly that um, sometimes you know parents um, aim to protect their children in, in ways that they know how and they feel is appropriate and in other ways um, you know there's a there's a threshold and so you know there's there's problems around that as well right that they don't feel either comfortable because they weren't raised that way. So it's a generational thing. And I think there does need to be a shift there as well. Yeah, and, and I think that case that you raised for us to, to look at, I think was a, a useful moment in thinking about distinctions, right? There's distinctions between kinds of events. And I'm speaking as a survivor here. I mean, survivors are perfectly capable of making distinctions and recognizing the complexities of culpabil culpability, right? That it's not always clear cut. And to, we want to make a space in which men, others who maybe have been involved in something and they're not quite sure whether they were culpable or whether it was morally um, right or not, can contribute to the conversation, can air their uncertainty. And we, because we need those stories, we need that thinking aloud to be part of our discussion about how we understand our sexual lives. So I, I just think it's important to say that because some people think that the survivor is like this hysteric axe murderer who's, who's going to go on a rampage in regard to everything. And, and that's just not the case. I've been in many, many survivor support groups, and, and people are quite, quite, uh, capable of, of making distinctions and nuanced judgments. So, another question? If, on the mic. Hi, my name's Ashley. I'm a student at Hunter College. I'm a media major, but I'm taking a women's studies course. Um, I wanted to ask, so in regards to things like social media, activism, collectivism, it's drawn like a lot of polarized debates. Like a lot of people love it. It's a global village. You have unlimited space to be heard. But then there's criticism where some people say liking a photo isn't really supporting the cause. And it's like a mini like battle going on. And like some people are even like losing sight of what Me Too is. They're like, oh, you're not really in this, you're not really an activist. So what do you think of like social media activism and like this whole debate of what makes you an activist? Good question. Yeah. I, I, I think you decide where you enter the movement, right? And, and your bandwidth to enter the movement. Um, I don't know, I come from the school where folks call you an activist, right? You don't just assign yourself as being an activist, like you're, you're told <laughs> that, that that's your title based on your actions and what it is that you have done. Um, but I do think that internally you will know, you know, the kind of contribution that you're making. I mean, I, I'll be honest, I, I, Vanessa should probably answer this because I'm not, you know, in those social media battles. I mean, 
you know, I have a whole organization, <laughs> so a whole other side of it where it's like actually young people coming in and, and, and working on programming and at the same time understand that, you know, that's the world that they also live in and, and where they actually are learning so much from and where they are so harmed from, right? Um, from, you know, call out sites that actually put video, break up video, um, where, where, where their peers put video, exposing them, um, whether it be, you know, pictures they sent of themselves or videos that they took together. And, and like a lot of harm also happens, you know, on those sites. So I understand how important online activism is um, and, and ways to engage. I mean, it's why, well, how we're here now. Um, and at the same time, I think that, you know, you decide for yourself where, where you enter the movement. Um, and then also, like, you'll know based on your actions, you know, how far your activism um, has, has reached. Do you want to add anything? Um, sure. I, I think, um, as with anything, it's just really important to put things into context. I mean, I think there's a lot of positives to online activism. It's created spaces for community building, for information sharing, which have been transformational, right? Um, but the other thing that I think we're learning is that, um, you know, for change to happen, it often happen, needs to be, you know, in long-term campaigns. There need to be strategies. And, um, you know, a lot of, you know, clicktivism, you know, is, is not always embedded in a strategic advocacy campaign. And so it's really thinking about, is this thing where it's asking me to click it or to share it, is it part of something that's been thought through and that is linked to people on the ground, to specific actions, you know, such as legislation or such as implementation? Um, a lot of times it's not. Like some of the most viral videos, you know, when they're not, then they, then they just go away. Um, and so, you know, if, if you all don't know, it is like 10,000 more times effective to call a congressperson and spend two minutes on the phone than it is to send like 100 tweets. Um, you know, so it's educating yourself on, you know, what's effective and what's contributing to change. Yes, ditto, and um, you know, I actually, I, um, I follow a lot of accounts, quite a few accounts, you know, that, that I find personally informative about the issues that, that, you know, are important to me and that I think are important to, to, to feel, you know, connected to. And, you know, I've made choices about the things that, that I, that, ref, you know, resonate with me and that I want to share. And I think Joanne is totally spot on. Like, you decide for yourself where you enter the movement. And there are plenty of posts and plenty of uh, sites that are uh, sometimes um, just facts and sometimes they're graphs and sometimes they're infographs and sometimes they're call this number to, you know, speak to your representative about X issue. And, um, you know, nobody knows how far an, any individual goes with social media activism. Maybe they're sharing, maybe they're making all those phone calls, maybe they're texting every time there's a post about something that needs to be texted about, you know. And I think that it, it's a personal thing. And so um, some of the bullying that goes on around how far, how much of an activist you are just because you're posting things on social media is actually part of the problem. So um, maybe we could just take a couple of other questions together and give our panelists a chance to finish up because we, we do have a reception waiting for us upstairs. And in that reception, not only is there food, but there's a chance for you to continue the conversation with each other and with our panelists. So let's get a couple of questions. There's, there's a guy in the back there, maybe him, and then uh, so we can. All right, um, I'll try to be quick. My name's Andy, I go to Hunter College. I was writing a few questions like while you guys were talking, so I tried to compress it as much as I could. So um, how can you reckon me to with the fact that black men are historically victims of weaponized allegations by women? And the fact that, like, I feel as if uh, any interaction between a black man and a non-black woman can be considered sexual harassment. And then, like, especially with the Title IX in college, how a lot of times uh, people who are accused don't have that many rights. That's, I know that's a lot, but yeah. But that's good. That's good. And then maybe, uh, can you get another, maybe two more? There's more over here. 
it on? Okay. Hi, um, I'm Alexia. I'm an officer in the U.S. Army, and I think my question is, we've had a conversation about inclusiveness and, you know, incorporating institutions and incorporating organizations. So my question is, how do you feel about adding pedophilia as a sexual orientation? There was a movement um, discussing that within the last couple of months in social media, and is that a movement that counters the Me Too? Um, do we give them a space? Do they deserve a space? Um, my name is Isabel, and I'm a sophomore at Hunter College. Um, my question goes along the lines of inclusivity. Oftentimes, when there's a movement, um, someone comes to the foreground, and people are often pushed to the background. Um, so in the realm of Me Too and inclusivity and women's rights, how do you broaden the conversation um, to everyone, and who do you feel like are still currently being left out of the conversation? Sorry. I wish we could get everybody in because it's really useful to know what's on people's minds. Um, it's, it's helpful for all of us. But I am Roslyn. I'm, uh, I'm an administrator at Hunter. And the question about institutions, and I just have a lack of faith in institutions and their ability to really bring about the change that we want to see. I think it's so very important. Uh, Vanessa made the point, uh, said something about uh, families and it's starting at home with those stories and as well the power of theater and art and those who have their hands, forgive the pun, their finger on the trigger to decide what scripts or at least in the absence of those scripts to create the presence of them by writing them, by performing them, by creating those stories, those narratives that educate people through the art, through the dialogue, and as well have those people within the institutions, Me Too, saying, Me Too, we're going to push from both ends to the middle to push out something new, to create something new from inside and outside because the institution that this democracy that we have that in this political system that allowed this megalomaniac to be in the white house shows you that the institution is something that is not trustworthy and so therefore i don't have a lot of faith in it and i guess i don't have a, i have a comment but my question then is, <laughs> how is it that the, how do you see Vanessa? How would you use, since you're, you have that passion for theater, you have the theater, how would you see that theater and, and policy being used to be able to create that change within the institution? Okay, it's a lot that we can't answer all of it, but let me give the panelists a chance for a last um, contribution to this discussion. Whichever issues you want to take uh, up. Okay, I'll just, I'm not going to take up all of them, um, but just to say, you know, in response to the, the first question, um, you know, we talk a lot about intersectionality. There are multiple oppressions happening you know, on race, on gender, on disability, on class. And, you know, I think this is where there needs to be more honest and difficult conversations. We need to confront the many different types of prejudices and discriminations and how these intersect. And so we just, we want that to be a part of this conversation. Um, and so then, uh, you know, just sort of relatedly to the issue of inclusivity, um, you know, how do we broaden the conversation? Who's being left out? I, I think a lot of people are, are still left out. Um, and, and I think, you know, we, in talking about Me Too, we're talking a lot about voices and um, who's speaking, but I think we also have to really think as much about listening, really, really deep listening. Um, you know, thinking about how 
uh, how to take the conversations to, to different communities and, and places and, and to listen. Um, and, and that means, you know, really some of the structures that we have do, do not make it easy for, uh, for people to enter those conversations. So it, it means a different type of, uh, I'm trying to be more articulate about it, but, um, you know, I think often uh, for people who are in activist circles, for people who are engaging in this, there's a way once you learn how to speak, then it's easy to speak, but we really have to keep listening. Yeah, I don't know that I could take all the questions either, but um, I, I do think about the question of inclusivity directly connects to the gentleman's question in the back about, you know, also black men, um, you know, being also survivors of sexual assault and child sexual abuse. I mean, we look at Terry Crews, is that his name, right? Um, you know, powerful actor who right now, he was asked to do a mental health assessment because he came forward as a survivor and and spoke about what happened to him, um, you know. So I think black men, black boys, um, are left out of the conversation. I it, and so talking about inclusivity, I think we have to have space for those nuanced conversation where, yeah, actually, um, the fear, right? We know, you know, the history of Emmett Till and the fear of uh, black men, even. Um, you know, even right now in colleges, the reality is that young men of color are getting kicked out of college just based off of um, accusation, right? Um, and then, and then when we look at young women of color or even black women, right? They are not believed, right? So, so there's not even a space for that. So we have to, within this time, and this is why five months isn't enough, be able to um, really uh, dissect and wrestle with. Um, those nuances and what it means and um, how you create safeguards and at the same time be able to believe survivors. Because, I mean, for our organization, for me, I'm, I'm always going to rest with survivors and believe survivors, which then leads to your question, no, pedophilia is not a civil right in my book. I don't know if I'll look into this and think different but my, <laughs> I doubt it, and, and, and maybe you have another perspective that you wanna lend to have a broader conversation about this, but um, I, I, don't, I don't see how that works, right? Um, even if you can't, just because you're a, you, you identify as a, a, a pedophiliac and you don't act on it, um, I don't see that as a civil right that requires civil protection. I see that, you know, uh, I'll, I'll reserve how I see that, but I don't see it as that. Um, like I see vulnerabilities um, or see you know, uh, human rights of, of youth, of, of people who are just basically trying to survive their everyday life requiring protection. Um, okay. Yeah, um, to, to speak on the point of, of the question about pedophilia as a sexuality, um, I think it's problematic in a lot of ways because um, there's one agent in that dynamic that has awareness and one being the child that um, perhaps has not fully developed to make a decision about that kind of a relationship. So I would see it as a huge problem of abuse. Um, so I would also say no. Um, and I think uh, to answer the question, um, Isabel and I are in class together, actually, um, who's still left out of the conversation. I agree. A lot of people, as Nisha said, a lot of people are still being left out of the conversation, but that's why we even came together to have this panel, right? It's like complicating this movement is part of why we're here and part of why we want this conversation to keep going and, and for people to keep feeling that they can be a part of this conversation, continue this conversation. Um, it doesn't just stay in this room. Um, and so I think that's that's part of the goal of the Me Too movement as well. And Tarana Burke has stated that very clearly. Um, uh, to answer Rosalind, Rosalind, is that right? Thank you. Um, I understand the lack of faith in institutions, and I completely uh, empathize and, and under, I understand, um, which is why I, I flocked to um, the the spheres that I did, um, and and. Um, I think narrative has played a major role in this conversation, and I think it will translate into a lot of women um, potentially and hopefully um, finding the courage to, uh, even if it doesn't mean telling their stories in a public sphere 
where it's their personal story and they're telling it to people in the audience. Maybe it means that it's um, that it's in a book and maybe it's partially fictionalized, but at least that's a way that she can say, this happened and, and it was real and I didn't imagine it and it, it is not going to get put away in some binder in the back of my mind. It's going to be it's going to be set down and it's going to ring out. And um, so my personal hopeful goal is to continue that, um, that platform and um, create a bridge, continue to create a bridge and build that bridge between advocacy and art and um, hopefully bring everybody that I can into that with me and they can create their own bridges and start to tell their own stories and, and to keep on ringing that bell of that call to action. Well, hold on just a second because I know Smita has some final announcements to make, but um, join me in, in thanking our panel for this discussion. <laughs> I want to extend my thanks as well. I feel, I feel just so profoundly grateful to be able to be in the audience and listen to you all. We've been working on this together for um, a while now, for many weeks, and um, and I think that this is. I'll speak for myself. This is this is so what um, I hoped for, and what we all hoped for was to have this thoughtful, nuanced conversation, and also to have so many students in particular invested in that conversation and to ask complicated, difficult questions that help push that conversation and help uh, help me and also others advance our own thinking about the conversation. So just another round of applause to, to our panelists. To our, thank you. Um, before we, we release you to the reception, and please do come up, I also want to say that a lot of labor goes into putting these together, and some people have been already named and others have not, and I just, I wanted to name Kelsey Adolphs, Joanne Velardita, Siobhan Healy, Rafael Munoz, Gabriela Cook-Francis, Daniel Culkin, and Melissa Harden, all individuals who are here at Roosevelt House and who work really hard day in and day out to, to make this happen so seamlessly and clearly. We also would love to see you here at other evening programs and events, and you really make the conversation come alive. By you, I mean students. Um, please do come back, and we actually have, and Professor Deb Tolma is going to talk about an upcoming event. So open up your programs and take a look at next week's event, which follows perfectly I think, on this week's event. And thank you to Rosalind and Vanessa, who provided a perfect segue for this event uh, that's happening next week. Slut the Seminar is uh, about a play. Um, and in fact, we'll have performances from the, uh, the play, which is called <coughs> Slut the Play, which is uh, written with and, and by young people, uh, with Katie Capiello, and performed by teen girls. And they will be here, some of the, the current cast will be here performing several monologues. Um, and Katie will be here to talk about art and performance as a, a strategy for activism, as a strategy for raising the, the ability and space for talking about sexual assault, uh, how that plays out among teens in particular in the worlds in which they occupy schools, families, communities, uh, and peers. Um, and we will uh, absolutely want to have you, students, um, and everybody in our community be part of this conversation and look forward to seeing you at Slot the Seminar. Please RSVP. Just a, a further announcement, October 5th and 6th, my colleague Charles Mills of the Graduate Center there and I are organizing a conference on Me Too, sexual assault, and epistemic injustice. So we'll talk about the issues of credibility that go in every direction in problematic ways. So Thank watch you. for that. Thank you. I also um, wanted to properly introduce Deb Tolman as a, as a member of the Women and Gender Studies faculty. And also, I think there are other initiatives and events coming up. Girls for Gender Equity is having a gala. Do you want to? 
is having a gala April 12th. And if you want to see the real Tarana Burks live, uh, she, will, she will be opening the gala. And we will um, honor Barbara Smith, Melissa Harris Perry, Alvin mm -hmm. Starks, and Margaret and Brittany, who are alum from our program. So it'll be a great night. Fantastic. It'll be at the Brooklyn Historical Society, um, April 12th, 6 p.m. Excellent. Vanessa, do you have an announcement you want to make? Yes. Um, for anyone who is interested, um, I'm also a leader and uh, a director and actor in this week's uh, Hunter V Day team, 2018 team for the Vagina Monologues and other stories. We're, we've selected um, certain monologues from Evensler's work, as well as we're bringing some other stories, uh, which are original stories by uh, Hunter students who have come up with their own monologues and will be presented. Tomorrow is the first performance. Oh, I'm sorry, the school's closed. Oh. Yes, it is. It's Snow scary. day. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay, so uh, I don't know when the first one is. It's gonna be Friday? Okay. Okay, maybe it will be rescheduled, it will, it will but be rescheduled. it will definitely be Friday yeah. and Saturday. All right. Um, I don't know if the Wednesday one will be rescheduled. It's just canceled. So tomorrow's performance is canceled due to school being closed. However, our performances on Friday and Saturday will be uh, going on from 7 to 9 p.m. at the Lang Recital Hall right here at Hunter. Okay. Um, so with school closed, you can come to the reception and not worry about <laughs> getting home on time to wake up early. Um, so please come on up, and thank you all so much again. Thank you.